Okay. So tonight, as we get into, oh boy, what is this, part five, I believe, of how to study the Bible, this one will be um, more of a how-to. So we're not going to really, we'll do a study tonight, because we're going to put our how-to to the test, um, but this is more of a how-to, and we're going to, as you can see on the board, you can go on through, yeah, you're good. Um, as you can see on the board there, concordances, we're going to learn how to use a concordance. Does anyone not know what a concordance is? Never heard of it? Good, okay, so we'll, we'll jump into what concordances are and how they'll help us. We're going to look at both um, a paper one, a book one, though I didn't have one because I don't use it anymore. I gave it away just a few weeks ago to somebody, and, um, and, but we're also going to learn how to use them online as well, okay? So this will really bless our study. And then also, we're, we're into our section now on the Sabbath, and so we looked at the golden thread last week, how from Genesis to Revelation we find the Sabbath truth taught. We looked at the Old Testament, right? We checked that box. We looked at um, end times. We checked that box. We looked in eternity. We checked that box. And then we went back and we looked at oh, the life of Jesus. We checked that box. And then we ended with um, the apostle, right? The ap apostolic age. And we checked that box so we could fill in and see that Genesis, from Genesis through, through eternity, we've got the Sabbath truth being taught, right? But we're going to continue that by looking at um, that other day, that some esteem and seeing what the Bible teaches about that. But first, all right, what is a concordance? Um, I've heard, you know, there's several different types of concordances. If you're going to use a book one, I suggest a Strong's Concordance. Uh, it, is, it is, to me, by far the best for lots of reasons. It is the most exhaustive um, in a good way, it, it, meaning that it has the most information in it. But also, strong concordances also have a Greek dictionary and a Hebrew dictionary in the back, and I'll show you in a minute how to use those, okay? So if you're in a bookstore or you're on Amazon and you're trying to remember what was that concordance that, that uh, Pastor Phil wanted me to use, just remember, if you want to study the Bible, you want to be strong, right? Not crude with a crudence, not young with a youngs, but strong with the strong's concordance, okay? All right, so inside a concordance, a strong concordance, it'll look like this. And I just grabbed a, a random page for you. Um, let's look at the word loosed for a moment, even though it has really nothing to do with our study. So you'll see right here, um, you'll see the, so first of all, you'll see every word where loosed is used, right? Every place in scripture from Genesis to Revelation where it's used. Then you have the mar places where it's found. So the first time is Exodus 28, verse 28. You'll see the word loosed. Then it gives you a little phrase where, um, where that word is used. And it usually, to save ink and space, it usually just puts the first letter because you know what that word is because we're looking under loosed. So it says that the breastplate be not L or loosed from the ifad. And then next to it, you have a number. Now, how many of you speak or read Hebrew? It's Exodus, and so that's, in, that's the, in the Hebrew section of the Bible, right? The Old Testament. The New Testament is written in Greek, Koine Greek. By the way, if I haven't mentioned this before, both of them are way better than English, far better than English. It's so much better to, to study the Bible looking at the original Greek and Hebrew because those words are very descriptive. There's reasons why uh, love. The word love in English, I love cheesecake. I love my wife. You've heard me use that example before, right? I love my wife so much more than cheesecake, of course, most of the time at least, right? Uh, there's times when I just really want some cheesecake. But um, okay, but we use the word love. Well, in Greek, you've got agape, you've got philos, right? And they all describe different kinds of love. And so you've got very descriptive uses in the Greek and Hebrew, and it's really, um, really wonderful. Greek is called the most scientific language in the world, Koine Greek, Biblical Greek, okay? Most scientific. In other words, it's so descriptive and so thorough that you really get a, bitter, a better um, grasp of what the writer is saying if you look at the Greek or the Hebrew. Anyways, that's what the number is for. If it showed you the Hebrew word, you would have no idea how to look that up in a dictionary, right? In an English dictionary, you know alphabetical, right? But if it had the Hebrew word, you'd have no idea, okay? How in the world do you look that up? So they assign numbers to all of them, and then you just go to the 
Hebrew dictionary and you look up number 2118 and there's your Hebrew word and it tells you in English what it means. Very, very descriptive. Just look at the word loosed. Loose. I mean, we're talking about loosening a belt, loosening, you know, uh, shoes, right? Look, one, two, three, four, five. I mean, there's like six or seven different words in the Hebrew. I'm sorry. There's about uh, four in the Hebrew and about four or five in the Greek. Different words for loose. I didn't look them all up tonight, so I won't bore you with it all tonight, but that'd be an interesting study. Why in the world do they have so many different words for loose? Because loose just means to untie, like how many different things. You look it up and you find all kinds of cool things about what loose could mean as you read through scripture. So that's what that number means there, okay? Oh, sorry. I actually um, zoomed in so you could see it a little better. And so there, there you'll see all of what I was just discussing, okay? So you can buy a concordance if you want a, a book on your desk. That's great. Um, William Miller, when he started his study of the scriptures in, in the, uh, what was it, 1818, I think he started, early 1820s maybe, when he started, he had two books in front of him, a concordance and a Bible. And he started going through, and he's the one who, you know, by the time he got into Daniel, really started to understand Daniel better than really most anybody prior to him. He had the Bible and the concordance. That's all he needed. And that's really all we need to really study the Bible as well. So you can have a book in front of you, or you can go digital. Have you seen BibleGateway.com? There are lots of concordances online, lots of apps you can have. This is my favorite, really not for any major reason, but it's just the one I started using early on, and I've used it for, I don't know, almost 10 years now, and so I'm really comfortable with it. So you can find one that, you're, uh, that, that works for you, but BibleGateway.com works the same. Now, let's say we wanted to look up the word loosed. You're going to type it into this section right here. You're going to pick the um, uh, version of the Bible that you want to use, and then you're going to go from there. So tonight, we're going to type in first day of the week. That phrase, first day of the week, into Bible Gateway, and here's what we find as we get into it. First of all, it shows you that there are not, that phrase is used nine times in the Bible. And by the way, it doesn't give you an exact phrase, and we'll learn that in a minute. Um, but nine times those words are used together in a verse there's also a topical index, 420 times. That's brought up in a topical index. That's for further Bible study. Um, then you'll have a suggested. A suggested. Like, so it kind of guesses. Well, you might be looking for this one, so we'll suggest something. And so it does. And then just below it, it gets into exactly what the results are. And it goes from Genesis to Revelation. So it's in order the way the Bible is written. The first time, you'll notice here, that these words are used together in a verse is Numbers chapter 28, verse 26. And that actually has nothing to do with what we're studying about tonight. So it works. But it says also on the day of the first fruits, etc. It's talking about the first fruits. So it has nothing to do with our study tonight on the Sabbath. But you'll get all of those kinds of things as well. Over here in the corner, if you, again, this is just a how-to. So I want to make sure you feel under uh, comfortable with it. If you want to just Old Testament, you just click on Old Testament. If you want just New Testament, you click on New Testament. Or if you want it just from a specific book, you could click there as well and see just those results there. Okay, now here's the ones that are really important to our discussion of the Sabbath. The next, now remember there was, there was nine. Here's number one. The next one, two, three, four, five. The next five results. Notice what they all have in common. Matthew chapter 28, verse 1. Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, etc., etc. Mark chapter 16, verse 2. Very early in the morning on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. Verse 9. Now when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared. What do all of these have in common? What are they all discussing? First day of the week. They're all discussing the first day of the week, and they're all discussing an event that took place on that day, which is the resurrection of Jesus. So the next five uh, results for first day of the week are all just simple history. They're telling us that Jesus was resurrected on the first day of the week. Okay? 
None of them say that there's any change of a holiness. Now, by the way, I should also define, in case there's anyone listening who's not sure, we don't believe that we should only worship Jesus on the Sabbath, right? Mm -hmm. We don't believe that. How often should we worship, worship Jesus? Yeah. Every day in every way, right? Whatever we eat, whatever we drink, all the things that we do, we should do for the glory of God, right? So we don't believe that, but we believe that there's a special set-aside activity of Sabbath, rest, and worship, right? So that's what we're looking for. If there was a change from Sabbath, the seventh day of the week, to the first day of the week, we're looking for some verse that says that. Okay, so these next five simply just state that Jesus was resurrected on the first day of the week. There's no other words there or statements there that make it sound like the Sabbath was changed or transferred from the last day of the week to the first day of the week. Okay? So now we've been through the first six of nine. So let's keep going down. This is all, by the way, if you're on a web page, this is all one, one page, right? All right, let's look at the next. We're going to discuss 1 Corinthians 16 2 next week as we further our studies on... Um, how to study the Bible. Tonight we're going to take care of John chapter 20, verse 19, and Acts chapter 20, verse 7. Let's notice John chapter 20, verse 19 first. Here it is at the top here. It says, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. Okay, now, let's discuss that for a bit. Um, what are the disciples doing? They've assembled. They've assembled, right? They've assembled in the upper room on the first day of the week. I've had people, I don't know about you, I've had people say, See, the very first day when Jesus was resurrected, the disciples were gathered together for worship. Had people say that to me, okay? Were they gathered together? Yes. Were they in the upper room where they had last been with Jesus? Yes. Do we learn there why? We do learn there why, okay? We'll get to that in a second. First, I want to keep showing you how to study this. You've got under every verse, you've got three options you can do. You've got in context. We've been discussing context this whole time. That's a great little tool for you. It'll show you the verse before and the verse after, okay? It adds verse 18 and verse 20 if you click on in context. It gives you a verse before and the verse after. That's a nice tool because sometimes the verse we're reading, as we've learned, does the verse we're reading always give us all the answers? No. And what's our first rule? Read some context, right? Get a little before, get a little after. Well, hitting that in context tool, click on it. Bam, now you've got the one before, you've got the one after. You could also click full chapter. That obviously is, guess what? The full chapter, right? John chapter 20 in its um, entirety there. And then you could also click on other translations, which is nice. Maybe you're reading it in the, let's say, New King James. But you're wondering, well, I wonder what the King James said. You click on other translations, and it has that verse in all of these translations. And it's a long list. I could only fit, what, the first... 12 or so, but the long list of um, other translations. All the translations, do they always use the same words? No, that's why they're translations, right? But I put this on here for a reason. What do we have? I didn't actually count. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. I was actually right, 12, okay? But I want you to catch, as we look at the first 12 translations, I want you to notice what phrase they all have. Here's uh, the first one, notice right here, for fear of the Jews. The next one, for fear of the Jews. Next one, for fear of the Jews. Next one, for fear of the Jews. Next one, fear of the Jews. Next one, fear to the Jews. Next one, they were afraid of the Jewish authorities. Next one, fear of the Jude Judeans, okay? All the way down all of the versions all give us the exact reason. So it doesn't matter what we're reading out of. They all say the same reason why they were gathered together. Was it for worship? No. It was because they were afraid. They were behind a locked door. 
And they were afraid. They had just seen Jesus killed. And here they were on Sunday, on Sunday, and they were afraid. By the way, they already knew at this point that Jesus' body was gone. They should have known why. I mean, literally, how many times did he tell them he was going to be resurrected on the third day? I mean, many, many, many times, right? But they didn't understand. Their mind was blocked. They were in darkness. They were panicked. They were like, where's his body? What's going on? So they gathered behind locked doors because they were afraid, okay? So that takes care of John chapter 20, verse 19. There are seven. In the first seven, have we seen any reason to transfer the day? No, no reason whatsoever, okay? So we've got two more to go. Let's look at the next one, Acts chapter 20, verse 7. Here, let's actually grab it in our Bibles. That way you read it out of the, the version that you have in front of you, whatever your choice version is. Acts chapter 20, verse 7. <clears throat> Before we read, in case I was going too fast, any questions on any of that? Uh, you know, could I just ask you one Sure, question? jump on in. Is the SBA Bible commentary the same as a concordance? No, the commentary, any commentary, obviously are my favorite is the SBA commentary as well, uh -huh. um, but uh, a commentary is just comments on the verses. Oh. So it's someone else's study, yeah. um, not necessarily inspired, Right? Our commentary uh, follows scripture, it follows the writings of Ellen White, but there's things that Ellen White didn't mention. There's things in the Bible that are mysteries, and the commentary comments on some of those things. I have largely agreed with our commentary. There's a few things here and there. I'm like, ah, I don't think so. I think I lean more this way or that way with it. So, but a commentary is just someone's comments or a group's comments on the verses, their own study on it. A concordance is no opinion, no commentary. It's just where the word you're looking up, or if it's digital, you can look up a phrase or a sentence, where those are used in scripture. Yeah. Yeah. All right, who would like to read Acts chapter 20 and verse 7? I will. Thank you. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. Okay. What day of the week are they gathered on? First, first day of the week, right? <clears throat> what are they doing? A couple of different activities, right? What is Paul doing at this gathering? He's speaking and preaching, right? All right, so first, let's look at just the verse alone, and then we'll get some context at the verse alone. It could, I guess you could say that it may imply that there's a worship gathering, right? At least there's a Bible study. Now, what night is tonight? Tuesday, and we're, what are we doing? Having a Bible study. Are we declaring Tuesdays now as, as a holy day? No. no. How often should we study our Bibles? Every day. How often should we listen to sermons? Every day, right? So just because someone's doing something religious on a different day, that doesn't mean that uh, holiness has been transferred. But let's say it could be so far. Maybe. Maybe it does. Maybe it doesn't. Let's keep studying here for a minute. All right. What's our first rule? What do we need to first see? If, if we look at a verse and something doesn't make sense, what do we what do? We do? We, we expand it. We read before and after, right? Before, I'm going to save us the, the trip of reading, before it just mentions that they came to Troas. Okay, it's their journey. So now let's notice the rest of the story. I've got it on the screen here, but let's keep reading it. Who would like to read um, 8 and 9, and then someone else to read 10 through 12? Anybody want to read verses 8 and 9? There were many lamps in the upstairs room where we were meeting. Even in the window was a young man named Eutychus, who 
sinking into a deep sleep and falls out on and on. <clears throat> when he was sound asleep, he fell to the ground from the third story and was picked up dead. I would like to read 10 through 12. Anybody? Thank you. Paul went down, threw himself on the young man, and put his arms around him. Don't be alarmed, he said. He's alive. Then he went upstairs again and broke bread and ate. After they talked, uh, after talking until daylight, he left. The people took the young man home alive and were greatly comforted. Awesome story. Yeah. Really cool story, right? Really great story. Really great story. All right. When discussing the Sabbath, we have not only a golden thread, Genesis to Revelation, but we actually have a commandment, right? A commandment that states, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And in that commandment, does it tell us exactly what day is the Sabbath? Yes. So we have a commandment. We don't just have hearsay. We don't just have a roundabout hint at it. We have a commandment. So if there is a change from the seventh day to the first day, what are we looking for? Are we looking for an example of someone gathering on the first day of the week? No. What do we need? We need a commandment, right? We need a command, preferably from the Lord himself. Who, who wrote the Ten Commandments? God. God did, right? So preferably, we need a commandment from God himself stating that the Sabbath was changed from one day to another. Okay, great story, wonderful story. If we were to study it, we would take us down a different road. But in this story, do we see a commandment? Mm -hmm. We see no commandment, right? They're gathered. Name some of the activities from your reading that they're doing. They're having bread. So that, 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 this must be, I don't know where Troas is, must be in Italy though, right? If they're e eating while they're meeting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> One of them is sleeping. One of them is sleeping and dying and then living again, right? Very good. This is a long one, by the way, a long meeting, isn't it? I mean, this is the first one I go to when, when someone tells me that church is too long or the sermon was too long, right? I do believe we can get too long. I think this proves that it can get too long, right? <laughs> it can get too long, but at this point, they'd been there for hours and hours and hours, right? And so, I mean, you know, I've, I've had complaints when a sermon is 45 minutes. I've had complaints when a sermon is more than 20 minutes. So you can't make everybody happy, okay? Um, but this is for hours, and this poor guy is sitting there in the window. Bad place to be sitting if you're getting tired, right? And he falls out. But there's no commandment there, okay? Um, what's happening the next day? They get tired. Yeah, so they've come to Troas, and they're there in mission work. They're ministering to the people there. And then they've gathered the night before they leave. What do we call that? A farewell party, going away party, right? They're having a get-together. Hey, thank you so much for what you've done. We've been so blessed. Hey, would you, would you rally the troops up one more time? Would you speak to us on one more occasion, okay? And that, that's what they're doing here, okay? But I want to teach you again how to use a concordance, and now we're actually going to look at some Greek as well, how to study the Greek. You never have to take a Greek class. You never have to take a Hebrew class because technology has caught up to us. Now you can do it right online, and it's pretty cool. But let's get into what we want to do. Here's what I did in Bible Gateway. I put in the word, break bread. Okay, the phrase, break bread. What does this mean? Was this a going away party? Were they just feasting? Were they um, having communion? By the way, even if they were having communion, that's okay. That doesn't mean that the Sabbath's been changed. What day of the week did Jesus institute communion? What day did he do it? It was a Thursday night, right? It was the night that he was betrayed, right? It was a Thursday night, okay? That didn't mean that Thursdays are now any kind of Sabbath day, right? So that's okay, too, if it, even if it was communion or... As I think we're going to discover, I think it could also mean that they were, I think they were eating, but I think it also could mean that they were discussing the word. They were breaking bread, 
right? They were, they were getting into the word. And we'll, I think we'll find that as we look at that. So type in break bread. There were, I think I should have wrote it down. I think there were 17 times in scripture those two words were used together, break bread. I only chose four. Why did I stick to these four? Well, what do they have in common? The first one is in the book of Luke. And then Acts has three. What, does the, what do the book of Luke and the book of Acts have in common? The author. They're both written by Luke. Luke is volume one. Acts is volume two. So that's study. That's context. All right, if we want to understand breaking bread, let's ask the author of Acts what he meant by breaking bread. Okay? So let's get into Luke chapter 24 Verse 35, why don't you turn there with me? Two books before where we are. Acts chapter 24, verse 35, Jesus is now resurrected. I'm sorry, Luke, Luke chapter 24. I have no idea what I said, but I'll believe you. I didn't say Luke. I did mean Luke. <laughs> Well, then I stick to it. I said, Luke, I have a witness. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so Luke chapter 24, Jesus is risen, and he has not yet visited with the disciples. He is visiting with some other folks on a road to a place called Emmaus. And who would like to read verse 35 for us? Luke 24, 35. This is after he has been with them. Who would like to read? Thank you, Miss Norma. And they told what things were done in the way and how he was known of them in breaking of bread. Okay. All right. Now, we've got to first put the, hit the brakes, slow down a little bit, and really think about this verse. It actually says something that should catch your eye. It actually says something that should make you scratch your head or bite your lip, or whatever it is that you do when you're a little confused. Did you catch something there that just doesn't quite sound right? Here's what caught my eye. So they're telling people that they've met Jesus, and it says he, uh, how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. Hmm. Did that ca does that sound weird to you? What were they doing? breaking bread, and it was in that act that he was known to them. How does eating food tell you that that's Jesus? Huh. Right? Isn't that what it says? It says that they, he was made known to them in the act, in the breaking of the bread. So I wanted to dive into that a little bit. Hmm. What does that mean? All right. Let's grab a little context here. All right, we're going to first look at verse 27. Who would like to read verse 27? Oh, I did write it down, by the way. It had eight results for break bread in the Bible. Eight results, and I just stuck to those four in Luke and Acts. Who would like to read verse 27? Thank you, Ray. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures that things concern, the things concerning himself. All right. So he was walking on the road to Emmaus with them. If you remember the story, they were sad. They were followers of Jesus, and he had been killed. And now his body is gone. And they just don't understand what's going on. Jesus appears to them and is talking to them. Do they recognize that it's Jesus? No. They don't recognize that it's Jesus, right? They're taught, he's like, why are you guys sad? And they're telling him why. And he starts telling And so, how does he answer their questions? How does he fix their hurt? He opens the Bible to them. And they study the Bible. Well, we're you saying the word Bible, but really it's the Bible in their day. It's the scriptures. It's the Old Testament, right? They open up Moses and the prophets. He expounds to them. Is he breaking bread with them? Yeah, because in the Bible, the Bible is, has a symbol of bread or food, right? Jesus says, not by uh, bread alone, right? But by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, okay? So he's opening the Bible to them. Now, by the way, who wants to read verse 30? They do also feast on food and bread, 
Anybody want to read verse 30? When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Good. Okay. Now, we've got three different ways that break bread can mean study the Bible, actually breaking bread and eating, or communion, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the Last Supper. Which ones are they doing here? It almost seems like they're doing all of them. Maybe they do that often when they get together. Yeah, they do. It's a normal cultural thing. When they're going to study the Bible and get together, they're also going to, you're absolutely right, Mary Lou, they're going to study the Bible. I mean, they're going to uh, eat bread, right? They're going to eat while they study the Bible, right? Um, okay, that's what they, and I would love to do that too, huh? Yeah? Anybody going to bring pizza next week? <laughs> Okay, so they're doing these things together, but the key verse here, verse 35, says that he was made known to them in the act of breaking bread. Did the uh, Last Supper service have some symbolism in it? And what does the breaking of bread represent? Yeah, his body being broken to them. Why, why were they sad? Because Jesus had died. His body had been broken. And he's saying, hey, guys, I need you to understand that's exactly what was supposed to happen. The Messiah was supposed to have his body broken. And that's why we've instituted this new service, to remember what has happened. And to prove it, he's gone back to the Old Testament and broke bread with him. He studied the word. So I have never understood, but none of his bones were broken. So why did they use that phrase? His body was broken for us? Yeah, yeah I, I think it's just the, sim, uh, the, the descriptive way of discussing death. Yeah. And that was, it, I mean, his body was beaten to a pulp, right? I mean, it was mangled. Yeah, yeah but good point. Yeah, no bones were broken in order to keep the, uh, the prophecy true. Mm -hmm. And which is further proof that there's something supernatural going on. What he went through, how badly he was beaten and abused and nails, and yet nothing, nothing, no bone on his body was broken. I think that's symbolic that no matter what we try to do to God, we can't, we can't beat God, right? We can't destroy God. Amen. Yeah, and so his body was not, his bones were not broken even if his body gave up in that moment, right? Uh, wasn't there something about when someone was crucified that was bring on their death with them? Yeah. They would break their legs so that their lungs would crush down like an accordion. Mm -hmm. And then they would die of suffocation. No one, far as I know, there is zero historical record of anyone dying from being crucified. It was not supposed to kill people. Oh. It was supposed to abuse them and torture them while they hung out in front of everybody and the birds and you know, uh, the heat uh, or the winter or whatever season it was in, it was supposed to be a moment of torture. And after long enough torture, they would break their legs, their lungs would crush, and then they would, um, what an awful way to die, right? After all that torture, mm -hmm. then to die by having your lungs crushed and you can't breathe anymore. Asphyxia, right? Terrible way to die. But Jesus died before that, right? He died about three and a half hours after he was hung up there because he died of a broken and melted heart, according to the prophecy. So Jesus wanted their minds to go to this. He wanted them to see, hey guys, this was fulfillment of the scripture. This is what the Messiah was supposed to do, because at that time they all believed the Messiah was gonna save them from Rome. And Jesus was like, no, guys, study with me, not from Rome, but from sin. I'm your savior for eternity, right? This is to cleanse your, your heavenly record of sin. And so he went, through Moses and the prophets with them for that. Okay? So, studying the Bible is what made known to them that he was the Messiah. Okay? And they understood it in the breaking of the bread of who he was, because that was their question. That's why they were scratching their heads. Wait a minute, why in the world is he dead now? It, what happened to his body? We're totally lost. And so he opened the word to them. Okay, now let's look at this word known. I want to show you how to use the Greek before we close. Here's a website I use. It's up at the top here, blueletterbible.org, blueletterbible.org. 
phenomenal, great website. This is an extensive Hebrew and Greek dictionary. Okay? So, um, it, 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 here you'll type in either the verse or the word you want to look up. I typed in to know or know. Just because I want to know. It said in verse 35, he was known to them in breaking the bread. I want to know what that meant. Like, is that a scholastic, intellectual no? I wanted to get into that. So I typed in no. Oh, I typed, I'm sorry. I typed in Luke 24, 35. And then if you click on the verse, okay, if you click on the verse, it's a link, so you click on the, on the, on the verse. This is what happens. The verse opens up. You've got the words in English. You've got, look at those numbers. Now we know what those numbers are, huh? What do you think the G is? Greek, right? Because this is in the New Testament. So it's Strong's Greek. So you go to the Greek dictionary, and you look up that number, and here you've got all the Greek words next to it. If you want to know how to pronounce it, you click on this little icon here, and it tells you the, the pronunciation of the word. So where is it now? All right. He was known. It's Greek 1097. It's the word Gnosko. Gnosko. Okay? So if you click on that number, Click on that number, here's what you get. Gnosko shows it to you in English, shows you the pronunciation, here's the pronunciation again, tells you it's a verb. The etymology is really cool. If the word comes from other words, so you can kind of see the recipe that makes that word, you can get into that. This word happened to not have an etymology because it was an original word. That was pretty cool. Now I want you to catch, here's the definition of Gnosko. To learn to know come to know, get a knowledge of perceive, I think it meant perception, or to feel. Is this just an intellectual knowledge in this word? Is this just simply like memorizing a Bible verse? I know John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, etc., right? That's an intellectual knowledge. But when you love God, you really know John 3, 16, right? Wow, God loves me. Wow. So this Gnosko is a little different, not just an intellectual, scholastic knowledge that you learn, something you feel, something you perceive, something you understand personally, okay? By the way, and just to further prove that, look at number three, Jewish idiom for sexual intercourse between a man and a woman. Adam knew Eve, and they conceived the son, right? This wasn't just some you know, intellectual knowledge. Oh, yeah, I know Eve. No, this was a special kind of knowledge between them that they shared together in conceiving um, a child, okay? So, it wasn't just that they knew, oh, wow, now we know that that was Jesus. They were like, wow, we just talked to Jesus. We totally understand what he was supposed to do. He's risen. And in fact, um, it says there, why didn't our hearts burn within us, right? He was here in our presence. Why? Why didn't it burn within us already? Okay. All right. So that helps us understand um, how to use the Greek. And when we, like I told you, there's different words. We might use the word no in lots of different ways. They've got little words, different words that mean different kinds of no. This one here is a special kind of intimate knowledge. They knew now, wow, we don't have to be sad anymore. We're victorious in what Jesus has done. He's, he died, but now he's risen for us, right? All right, so sorry. Let's get back to this now. We looked at Luke. Here's the last three. We've already read chapter 20, verse 7. That's what we're studying about, this breaking bread. Uh, let's look at these last two as we close. Acts chapter 2. Both verses are in the same chapter. So if we get to Acts chapter 2, we'll read these, discuss, and we will wrap up. Acts chapter 2. And then we're going to look at verse 42 and 46. The other places where Luke used this term, break bread, there's something else we got to catch here about this breaking of bread. Who would like to read verse 42? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Interesting. What kind of breaking bread is it? Probably. I mean, it could also be, again, like Mary Luther, I think they did these things together. But it's not just that they sat down and ate a meal. 
It's saying they're breaking bread, but because they're breaking bread, what else? They understand doctrine, right? Doctrine and fellowship. What a good uh, Tuesday night Bible study before our service Sabbath, right? Coming up in a few days. Bible and fellowship. Doctrine and love for one another. Loving God and loving one another, right? And so these things work together. And then who would like to read verse 46? I will. Thank you. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Nice. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. How often were the disciples doing this eating of bread, actual bread, and breaking of the holy bread together? How often did they do that? Every day. Every day. Daily. So no, yeah, in Acts chapter 20, verse 7, it's the first day of the week, but that seemed to be because he's leaving the next day. There's no holiness applied to the first day of the week there. In fact, they were reading their Bibles every day. How often are we supposed to be reading our Bibles? Every day. And they're not just reading their Bibles. They're studying their Bibles every single day, right? From house to house, getting together for fellowship and for Bible study, okay? So while we see no um, connection to holiness of the first day, we've got one more verse. Don't forget, that's what we're going to get to next week in 1 Corinthians. We've got one more verse to go. But we've learned something else important about studying the Bible. We've learned how to use a concordance. We've learned that you don't have to go to school now to understand Greek and Hebrew. You can get it right online. And by the way, it might be hard the first time or two. Give yourself a chance. You'll learn it. You'll get used to it. Piece of cake eventually. But here's the other thing we've learned about studying the Bible. Every day. Every day, set time aside for God's word. Okay? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for being with us this evening. Thank you for protecting this time for us, for giving us focus and energy as we studied and Lord, most importantly now, convict the hearts to do as the disciples did, to spend time together in fellowship, loving one another, caring for one another, but to do so with the word as the central figure. Spend time together discussing the Bible in our conversations, lifting up your word, sharing thoughts from the Bible as we discuss our family issues and problems and our stress, as we, you know, vent to one another. That's fine too, Lord, as we vent but let us do it with the word of God being the central focus because that is our bread that can strengthen us. And Lord, we, do, we know we need strength every single day. In Jesus' name, amen.